What kind of conversation did Jesus have with Peter? That's what we're going to talk about today in John 21. Well, we have reached the very last chapter of John. And so we see that Jesus had revealed himself to people. He was around for 40 days after his resurrection. And 40 days, again, is going to be that number, like 40 days in the desert, 40 years wandering in the desert, 40 days Jesus is going to be with his people. And it says that Jesus, again, revealed himself to the disciples. They were in what John calls the Sea of Tiberias. Now we have lost many Caesars. Now we have Tiberias. So it's the Sea of Tiberias. So Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, the sons of Zebedee, and the other disciples were there. And Peter says, I'm going to go fishing. You ever meet those people? They're primarily fishing people who the very first moment they have a moment to do anything. I'm going to go fishing. It's their, it's, they have the bumper sticker on their car that says, I'd rather be fishing. Whatever it is they were going to go do, that's Peter. <laughs> He's going fishing, which is interesting. And so they're like, okay, well, we're all fishermen. We'll go with you. So they all go in the boat and caught nothing that whole night. And just as day was breaking, it says Jesus was on the shore and they didn't recognize him. I mean, if it were me, and I had just seen my Lord come back, I would be all about looking for Jesus. <laughs> They'd see him and they don't recognize him. And Jesus says to him, you know, uh, children, you know, and it does not necessarily mean children kind of in a little way, but hey, boys, did you catch anything? <laughs> that kind of thing. And they're like, no, we didn't catch anything. He goes, you know what, Al, why don't you go throw it on the right side of the boat? I think you'll find some there. And they did that. And all of a sudden there was plenty of fish. Now, this is kind of funny because it mentions that they caught a large quantity of fish of 153 of them, which is kind of funny in a way, because there's a lot of commentaries that will try to tease out, well, if you take this number versus that number. Now, there are places that I absolutely believe the numbers matter. Primarily, we talked about the 40 days or anytime 40 is mentioned. But when we talked about the seven times seven generations, and then 50 is the Jubilee year, the year that Jesus and his ministry, the generation of Jesus and his ministry is one of Jubilee, meaning the 50th, because that is when people are let go of their debts. And in this case, it's going to be their debt to God. So there are some number of things that I do think matter. In this particular case, I think it's just 153 fish. It's kind of funny how many ways that people tried to tease this out into some sort of a deep meeting, but I think it's just, that's how many fish they caught. Peter recognized Jesus when he, as soon as he hit him, because then it's hitting back to when they first met Jesus and they had fished all night and they didn't get anything. So he knew. So he said he put on his outer garment because he was working and threw himself into the sea. So he just plunged himself in because that's Peter, right? He's impetuous. And then the other ones came through the boat, dragging the fish there. And so they got there and they saw a charcoal fire and some fish laid out. Jesus made him breakfast, right? That's nice. And he says, you know, bring over some of the fish that you caught. Peter went aboard, got some fish, but amazingly, the net wasn't torn. Come on, come have breakfast with me. You know, Jesus is reaching out again in that you're my brothers. We're going to have a meal together. Meal fellowship was and is a big thing among many Christians throughout the world. But he, again, he's not being scary. He's not being threatening to them. He's not rebuking them. He made them breakfast and says, you know, come over here and let's eat some breakfast. So the disciples, it said, didn't ask him who he was because they knew it was Jesus. Took some of the bread and some of the fish and gave it to them. Now this, it says, was the third time that Jesus revealed himself to the disciples after he was raised to the dead. So it's not like he's coming back every day, day to day. And that's where the fishing, I think, was kind of the interesting part of it. He tells them, you go out and forgive people in my name. And so what do they do? They go fishing among themselves where there's no one else in the boat, you know? <laughs> so I think that's the interesting part of it. And so when they finished breakfast, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, using his old name, son of John, do you love me more than these? We don't know what the these meant. Was it the fish? 
probably not the fish, probably the other disciples, right? Do you, do you love me more than the, these guys right here? Well, yeah. And Jesus uses the term agape, which is that all encompassing, gigantic love. You know, this is what's kind of interesting is Simon comes back and says, yes, Lord, you know, I love you. But he uses the, the filio, the brotherly love. I love you like a brother. Boy, have you ever been a girl and ask a boy like, do you love me? And then the guy says, yeah, I love you like a friend. You know, it's not a great feeling, right? But that's kind of what's happening here. <laughs> then he says, feed my lambs. Does he mean the young ones, you know, teach the young ones or teach those who are new in the church, but tend them or feed them, care for them. So he said the second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Again, agape. And he said, well, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Again, filio, then tend my sheep. Not the lambs, but the sheep. You know, so now we're the young church, the older church, whatever you, way you want to look at it. And he says to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? But this time he uses the word filio. And it says that Peter was grieved. He got asked for the third time. Was he grieved because this kind of harkens back to being denied three times? Or I didn't feel like you have to ask me three times. I've told you already. Or was it that Jesus used the other term for love? The same one that Peter had just said back to him. Do you love me? You know everything. You know I love you. And Peter does respond again in the filio, love. Feed my sheep. Truly, I say to you, when you were young, and this is the prophecy he has for Peter, you used to dress yourself. You walked wherever you wanted to go. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hand. Another will dress you and carry you to where you do not want to go. And it says right here in the text, he's telling Peter the kind of death he's going to have that will glorify God. The tradition is that not only was Peter going to be crucified, but he didn't want to be crucified in the same way that his Lord was crucified. So he asked to be crucified upside down and then set on fire. He is going to be brought someplace he does not want to go. And this is the kind of thing that Peter is going to have to face in his life. But after that, he, Jesus says to him, follow me. I mean, you can kind of feel like in a lot of ways, this is what God constantly asks us. Do you love me? Do you love me more than all these other people? Do you love me more than all these other things, these other distractions you have in life? You know, in, in Peter's case, it would probably be fishing because that's what Peter wants to do. He wants to go fishing. Do you love me more than everything? We, we say, yeah, of course, I love you, Jesus, more than anything. Follow me. That's the message right there. Peter then turned and saw John, the disciple that Jesus loved, it even brings out more detail. The one who was leaning at the Last Supper, asked who was going to betray him. Peter looks, he sees John, the writer of this book. And then Peter says, well, what about this guy? What about this guy? What's going to happen to him? And here Peter's like, you told me this really horrifying thing. What's going to happen to him? And Jesus says, if it is my will that he remains until the time I come back, what's it to you? You follow me. Wow. Then people got the wrong message because people always get the wrong image. He's going to never die. He's going to stay alive until Jesus comes back. But the real message was, what's it to you? What happens to him? He says, this is the disciple right now who's bearing witness, who has written down all these things. He's saying, what I'm telling you is true. I've written all these things down. And then it says that there are many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written down, I suppose the world itself could not contain the books that would it would be written. It's just so full of words and actions and things that Jesus does for people. He couldn't even write it all down. We talked about that, how I believe it was 52 days of Jesus' mission in three and a half years was mentioned in all of the different Gospels. There were many other days. Some of those days were traveling days. Some of those days were resting days and prayer days. Some of those days he said similar things, did things with other people. We know already that the Gospels could not contain all the things that Jesus said and all the things that Jesus did. 
The interesting part where Peter says what's going to happen to him and Jesus says, it's none of your business. If I wanted him to live until I come back, he would live. That's where C.S. Lewis got that part. And I did a podcast about that just a couple of weeks ago in Small Steps with God, episode 87, where I talked about Narnia. And this kid was riding on a horse with Aslan, which is Jesus, and saying, well, how come this, this, and this happened to this other person? They had this situation. I never had that situation. And Aslan says, that's not your fate. And that's where this quote in Narnia comes from, where it's the boy and his horse, and this kid named Shasta is wondering why his life turned out a certain way. Why couldn't I have that life? Why couldn't I have these things? And this is what Aslan says to him. I tell you your own story, not hers. No one is told any other story but their own. We have to realize that we can't have other people's lives. We can't have other people's fates. We're, we are given our own fate and our own lives. And what happens to Peter is, is not anything against Peter or anything for Peter. And what happens to John, dying essentially of old age after exile, was all, everything was within God's will. John was able then to look back, write this book of John with that retrospective after reading all the other acts of the apostles from the other books and fully explain what this means. And that's what he's done here. But Peter shouldn't try to compare his end to John's end or anything else like that. And I think that's a really important message. And so what I'm going to meditate on is how God at times asks us, do you love me? And when he says it, he can often say it in the way of agape, the ultimate love. And sometimes we're just not there yet. We're not there to say agape back. We love you like a friend. We love you like a brother. But are we ready to go that full distance, full measure love? And in the end, I don't think Jesus was putting Peter down by finally in the third, do you love me? going down to Peter's level and saying, Filio, you know what? I think it's more that God is meeting us where we're at. Okay, you're not ready for agape? Let's talk about Filio. What I'm going to pray about is that idea that sometimes there's something that God has to say to us that's big, that could be scary to us. But in the end, he just says, you know what? Just follow me. Keep your eyes on me and follow me. I pray that no matter what happens, no matter what circumstances we encounter, we're always just looking to follow Jesus. And what I'm going to share with other people is that that in the end, what is God has asked for us, for all of us, is that we should just follow him. Don't pay attention to what's happening with this person, that person. Don't pay attention that What's going on with you and your past betrayals? You know what? Start today and follow Jesus. It's all he's asking for us. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Now we are going to book five, which is going to be Acts. And we have just done the Gospels. We saw four different points of view, four different purposes for four different books. I think it was interesting to see how those perspectives changed the text that was included, the way that it was presented. And now we're going to go on where our Dr. Friend Luke writes the next part, which is Acts, Acts of the Apostles. Mm-hmm.